going to sing a song, and how many here have heard of Legacy 5? Legacy 5. Okay, Southern Gospel. We're going to sing a song, Leg Legacy 5 uh, sang, and uh, it's not going to sound like Legacy 5, I can tell you that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we're going to sing it, it's called, I Stand Redeemed. And, and you know, you stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and because of the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, we can stand before Him unashamed when, 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 when we stand in His presence when He calls us home. Unashamed because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So we're going to try this. And uh, yeah, if we mess up, so what? We're, we're going to sing it anyway. We sing it from our hearts, and we hope that you enjoy it. I stand redeemed.
here. <laughs> Rather interesting how God works. Uh, buddy, this morning at Sunday school time, as his opening scripture read out of Joshua chapter 1, and that's what I wanted to share with everyone this morning just briefly with Dory and Nathan. But here's what it says in Joshua 1, the first nine verses. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend to the desert of Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittites, excuse me, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate, it on, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So he, he starts off and he says to Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. And so I'm thinking, you, know, you guys yesterday just went through a graduation ceremony. You finished one phase of your life. And you have great memories of school of the years that you spent at Northern High School. You'll think of all the friends that you've made, all the teachers that you've had, and you'll think of all the successes that you've had. And don't take it the wrong way, but when he, when, when he tells, tells Joshua that my servant Moses is dead, Moses is dead. You'll always have those fond and great memories of school. You really will. You'll think back of all those good times that's graduation. You've come beyond that. Now you are commencing and beginning a new chapter in your life. And as God told Joshua to be strong and courageous, he's also telling you that. Because over the next, over the next several years, over your lifetime, you're going to be embarking on a lot of different things, a lot of opportunities that's going to be presented before you. A lot of temptations are going to come your way. And God is telling Joshua to be strong and very courageous. The temptations will come where it's, it seems like it's going to be so easy just to come and to get into those. But he wants you to keep the law of the Lord. Or he wants you to keep Jesus in your heart. No matter what comes your way. He wants you to be strong and courageous. And if you keep Jesus in your heart and let him walk with you and let him guide you and let him be your leader, then you will be successful. So as you embark upon this new chapter in your life, as you commence into this new chapter of your life, we want you to know that we as a church will always be praying for you, that we'll always be here for you, your families will always be here for you, but most importantly, that God will always be with you. It says in the scripture that he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. But you need to bury the word of God in your heart. And the way that we bury the word of God in our heart is through his word. And so, so the church would like to present to each of you this token. And we just simply ask that you take this 
and don't let it collect dust. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, always keep the Word of God with you, relying upon Him. His promises are true. He does not lie. We'll go with you. Is there anything that you'd like to share? Nathan, I know that you've been writing this speech out for a long, long time. Gloria, I'm not sure if you've been rehearsing it in your heart or not. But is there anything you'd like to share? Uh, I guess after I'm graduating, I'm going to go to uh, Prosper for a four-year degree in earth science. That's about all I know. And, and, but, okay, and you always got to refresh my memory. Your goal is to be a what? It's called a paleontologist. A paleontologist, which is a study of dinosaurs? Or a prehistoric life. That would be, oh, awesome. let's see, who in here is a prehistoric figure? <laughs> Your mom and dad. Your mom and dad, you can study them, you can, you can stay at home and learn. Okay, so you're going to be a paleontologist. Okay, Dory, what about you? Oh, well, for nursing. Okay, what kind of nurse would you like to be? What? An RN. An RN. Okay. 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 Very good. Well, you know, you'll be you'll be touching a lot of lives in both areas. You know, a little different area. Now you won't be touching prehistoric lives. You know. <laughs> well, we talked about dry bones last week, didn't we? You know. So we we'll both be touching a lot of lives, and uh, we're very proud of you. And we certainly, uh, church, just want you to know that. We'll always be praying for you. We'll always be here for you. If there's anything you ever need, you just let us know. Do not be shy and do not hesitate away from letting us know. Okay? Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you this, uh, this morning, Father, thanking you for these two. Praying and ask that you touch Dory and Nathan as they venture off into a new chapter in their lives. Lord God, you've been with them and you've taken care of them throughout the years. We pray and ask, Lord God, that you give them strength and you give them the courage that they need to move forward. We ask that you bless them. We pray and ask that you keep them in your care. We pray and ask that you, that you overcome them and overpower them with your Holy Spirit. And allow them to know that you are with them. Even when those difficult and hard times may come, and they will, let them know that you are with them. That you'll never leave them, that you'll never forsake them. And we pray and ask, Lord God, that you'll allow them to let their light shine. So that others will see you in them. Bless them and their families and keep them, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. This is Pentecost Sunday. At Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Pentecost Sunday is what we refer to perhaps as the birth of the church. It's the conclusion of the Feast of Weeks. And, and in the Old Testament time, the Feast of Weeks was just simply a period from Passover to this time, and it was a period of the harvest. So it was a celebration that, they, that, they, that took place, and people from, uh, from all over would come back into Jerusalem to take part in this great feast, this great celebration that was going to happen. So if you have your Bibles this morning, please turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. A lot of people call it the book, or the, uh, the book of the Acts of the uh, Apostles. Some people, a lot of people refer it to the Acts of the Holy Spirit. As you read through the book of Acts, at your leisure sometime. Try to keep that in mind as you read the chapters that the Holy Spirit is at work in every chapter. 
So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And we'll read the first 13 verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that as we take a look at this day of Pentecost that happened 2,000 years ago, it's still relevant today. And it's also significant to our lives, Father, as to who we are as believers in you. So help us, Lord God, to take a look at your word this morning. And help us, Lord God, through your Holy Spirit, to come to a better understanding and a better knowledge. But, Lord God, a filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Just be with me as I speak to the church this, 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 to this moment, Lord God. Whatever you once spoken. Asking this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit, as we look throughout the Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, the entire Bible is filled with the Holy Spirit. We go all the way back to Genesis. It says when the Spirit of God was walking in the garden, that was the Spirit of God. We read of the prophets who spoke for the nation Israel, spoke to the nation of Israel, to the Jews. They were prophets speaking for God, being given the words to speak through the Holy Spirit. Things that were written in the book of the Psalms that David wrote and all the other psalmists wrote, and those that were written in the book of Proverbs, all given through the Holy Spirit. When we get to our New Testament times and we read where Zechariah was in, in the temple and he came out and once John the Baptist was born and Zechariah prophesied, he prophesied through the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary in the conception of Jesus Christ. It was the Holy Spirit who, when, 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 when Mary went to Elizabeth's house to meet her, to visit with her, and Elizabeth herself was pregnant. Mary's pregnant, and it said that Elizabeth said that the baby within me leaped. That's the Holy Spirit. And when Mary gave Mary's song, her testimony, that was the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples before he was ready to go to the cross before his denial, before his betrayal, he told them that someday soon, very, very soon, just wait upon it. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will guide you and give you directions. He will reveal all things to you. That he is the great comforter that is to come. As John the Baptist went out preaching, he talked about Jesus Christ coming into the world and that he will baptize you with a baptism, unlike the baptism that he was baptizing with, of water. But he'll baptize with fire and with power and in the spirit of the Lord. <coughs> Jesus 
Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples after the crucifixion. After the resurrection, he appeared upon them. And in the, in the Gospel of John, it said he breathed upon them the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus... On Ascension Day, 10 days ago, goes up into heaven. And the angels tell the disciples that the same Jesus you see going to heaven will someday come again. 10 days removed now, they're in this upper room again, having those same uncertainties that they've had. Not sure, not knowing what's going to have become of them. Just trying to remember and trying to hold on to the things that Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit will come upon them. And I'm sure that they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. Had no idea that this power was going to come upon them. That as we get to our scripture reading this morning, that the Holy Spirit was going to come and light upon them and look as, as though little fires upon their heads. And that they would be able to go out and speak in different tongues so people can understand what they were saying. I'm sure they had no idea. But it happened that way, that as they were waiting in the upper room, it happened just as that. It said a violent wind or a heavy wind, like a tornado force, came upon the area and overcame, overpowered them. The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit moves, moves with power and moves with might. God will speak to us, and sometimes in the still, small voices. But the Holy Spirit will let you know when the Holy Spirit is present. Because this great wind came. That's the breath of God coming upon them. Moving in their midst. Something that's never happened before. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit overcame, overpowered them. We read in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts how they were in the room praying and they were asking for boldness to be able to go out and proclaim the word of God. And it says that they prayed when they were finished praying. It says that the, that the room that they were in shook. It shook. The power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we dismiss the Holy Spirit and saying, well, the Holy Spirit just isn't active in the life of 21st century church today as it was 2,000 years ago. But we have to always remember that God is the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. He's the same today as he was 8,000 years ago. And he'll be the same 8,000 years from now as he is today as he was 8,000 years ago because he never changes. So we have to believe in reading the scriptures that that same God, that same power that we sang about, that was present then, is present today. You have to believe that. That is the foundation of your faith. This is the birth of the church that we're talking about. So when this great violent wind came in and overtook them, overpowered them, they were able to go out and speak. And as people heard them speak, they heard them speaking in the language of their native country. Prophesying. Speaking the word of God to them. Speaking the word of truth. And they were amazed because they each heard them in their own language. We know as we read the scriptures that, that speaking in other tongues or other unknown languages is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And they were able to do this. They believed. But some didn't. We know that as we read the scriptures. Some didn't. Just like the mockers of today and God forgive us because sometimes we are the mockers of the day. That when we hear of someone doing something great for God, that when we hear of people giving a testimony or giving a prophecy or revealing one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the world is mocking. 
They say they are fanatics. They are out of their mind. They hear people speak in an unknown tongue, an unknown language. And they say, as they said back in this time, they are full of wine. Full of wine. Because they are not willing to accept the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have that tendency in the church today. That we as a church so often will in our own minds, in the deep recesses of our minds, seriously doubt the Holy Spirit. But we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. Part of the Trinity. I don't understand all of it, and I don't think anyone in this room understands all of it, and I don't think the greatest theologian born understands all of it, but the Holy Spirit is part of the triune, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, giving to us the people of Jesus Christ, giving us the boldness that we need to be able to testify to God's goodness, giving us the, the knowledge and the understanding to be able to, and the wisdom to be able to go out and witness to people, irregardless of the persecutions that we may undergo. That when we come under persecutions, we go out on the job that we have, and we've mentioned the name Jesus, and the laughers, and the scorners, and the mockers say things that, that, uh, would, that, that would make us just want to shrivel and, 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 and bend down and kind of go in the corner and hide. But it's the Holy Spirit that will give you that boldness to stand up and testify as to why you believe what you believe. The Holy Spirit. We in the church, though, we have a challenge. We have a challenge because sometimes we just, in, in our learnings, uh, when we first become uh, Christians or when we first come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the unfortunate part so often, so many times, is that we don't have an understanding of the Holy Spirit. So consequently, we turn out to be, uh, as a group of people, 2,000 years ago. That if you have your Bibles with you, turn, turn just a little bit further out of Acts and go back into Acts chapter uh, 19. Chapter 19. And as you turn there, uh, this is going to be Paul in, a, in, a, in Ephesus. Paul wrote a letter, an epistle to the church at Ephesus. But here is a, a time that Paul is in Ephesus. To give you a little back, backdrop information, a, a man of God, uh, a very knowledgeable, learned man, the scripture says, in chapter 18 of Acts. His name was Apollos, and he would go around the country preaching Jesus Christ bringing people to the salvation and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he was going about talking about Jesus, and people were coming into that heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. But it says in the scripture in chapter 18 that Apollos was baptized with John's baptism. In other words, what he did is he listened to John the Baptist preach, saying, of talking about Jesus coming into the world, who is going to baptize in the power of of the Holy Spirit. But Apollos missed what happened on the day of Pentecost. He was a man of God. He loved Jesus. He accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But he missed Pentecost. He missed what the Holy Spirit did on that day. So he was baptized with the baptism of John. John the Baptist. And so, so Paulus was going around preaching that, that acceptance of Jesus, which was okay because he was, going to man, he was a man used by God. But a couple named Priscilla and Aquila heard him, took him aside and said, what you're doing is good, but let's take it a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper. And so Priscilla and Aquila ministered and witnessed to Apollos. But what happened in, in, in all of Apollos' journeys, he was in this town, this city called Ephesus. And 
And he left Ephesus, but then Paul comes in. And if you, and if you read in chapter 19, we're just going to look at the first couple of verses. Rather interesting. This reminds me just so much of the church today. Beginning in verse 1. While Paul was at Corinth, so Paul has now moved on, uh, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, prophesied. And there were twelve, there were about twelve men in all. So what happened, I believe, is that is that these twelve men heard from Apollos of Jesus Christ. And so they were baptized, baptized with the baptism of John. And again, I just believe that the church today so often is baptized with the baptism of John, baptized in the name of Jesus. And I can, we, 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 can, we can only speculate as to how these conversations took place with uh, Paul and these 12. How, you know, Paul probably heard when he got into Ephesus, the works of Apollos, and, and probably learned about the, the preachings of Apollos. Maybe he, he, he met with these believers, and they had that discussion. The scripture doesn't reveal, so we just have to take some liberties or take some speculations or some thoughts as to maybe what happened. But as Paul's sitting down and meeting with these believers, there's probably just something revealed to him that, he, that, that just gave him that indication that they kind of missed the Holy Spirit. They missed the Holy Spirit. Can Satan said be said about us? Have we? Have we? Has the church missed the Holy Spirit? Or what baptism baptism were you baptized of? These men believe in God. There's a lot of speculation as to well, were they really saved or not saved. But I believe the scripture reveals to us that these men were saved because they believed in Jesus Christ. The scripture says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So I believe these men were saved, but they knew nothing of the Holy Spirit. See, they were going around, Apollos was going around preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. And that the Holy Spirit was going to come. Paul missed the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. These men certainly missed the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so they had this discussion where Paul's revealing that it's already happened. It's already happened. We have this tendency in our church to forget that it's already happened. Everything that has been done for us already, everything's been done. Jesus Christ came, he went to the cross, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came at the time of Pentecost. We have what we need. We are no longer looking forward to the Holy Spirit, rather we are looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has already been given. These men did not know that. And I just wonder, and I just, I just think, do we know that? Do we know that? That it's already been given. You see, so, so often we get wrapped up in our lives and, and thinking that, that, that the power that of the Holy Spirit is for someone else, that, that it's just not for me because of my busyness, or, or maybe, maybe I'll, 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 I'll take on the Holy Spirit and accept the Holy Spirit and the things that have been mentioned in the Scripture, maybe tomorrow when I get some things done today that I need to get done, and I'll really start 
getting into the Holy Spirit thing, trying to learn a little bit about the Holy Spirit, and we forget that it's already been done. All we have to do is just pause and accept that in our lives. The Holy Spirit. So Paul, with these men, says in the Scripture... Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, and that is in Jesus. When you think of the Holy Spirit, what do you think of? When you think of the Holy Spirit, do you think that you have to speak in other languages and in other tongues. In the scripture it tells us that there's two different types of speaking in other languages and in other tongues. One is to speak where people can hear me speaking in their own native language or in, in, in an unknown tongue where there's going to be an interpreter. That is one type of speaking in other tongues. And we read about that in the scripture. We read about that in the day of Pentecost. And we hear about this, that when Paul laid his hand upon these 12 men, it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized and, and, and prophesied and spoke in other tongues. That's one type of speaking in other tongues. The other type of speaking in other tongues is when we are praying to God and there's times that we give utterances to God in a language that we ourselves don't even know. Each and every person who is a born-again Christian has spoken in tongues because you've cried out to God, perhaps at times, to God with a language that you don't even know because it comes from our heart and some groanings. And we pray. It's in other tongues. But each and every born-again believer who has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and who will acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. Not all speak in tongues. Not all interpret the tongues. There are some that will prophesy. Some will have faith. Some will have different works that the Holy Spirit gives. But we're all given that gift of the Holy Spirit. All different. But have you accepted it? Have you accepted it? So many people, so many people talk about their Christian walk and how it is that that it's an up and down walk. That it just seems like sometimes they I've heard people say that my life's like a cup that has a leak in it. And that I just have to keep on filling my cup up with the word of God. And, 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 and calling upon God and calling upon the Holy Spirit. It sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, you know, to always call upon Him and always get into His Word. You know, but you know what? As a Christian, our cup doesn't leak. Our cup really doesn't leak. What we have to do as Christians is we have to immerse ourselves in God's Word. We have to take God's Word and bury it in our hearts. Daily. Continually, you know, if, if you if you if you think of that cup situation, if you hold that cup up and it has a leak in it, that water is going to come out. I, I think of my grandson. You know, when he's taking a bath, he has these toys in there that are cup-like shapes, different shapes. One of them doesn't have any holes on the bottom. Another one has like four or six holes. Another one has one hole in the bottom. You know, you fill it up with water, and the water rolls out of the holes, right? But if you were to take that cup, and if you were to immerse that cup in that bathtub, and surround that cup continually with water, there is no leak. There's no leak. We need to immerse ourselves continually in God. Calling upon Him continually. Trusting in Him continually. Believing in His Word. Living in His Word. 
coming to know him more on a closer personal relationship. Holy Spirit, Jesus living inside of you, giving you the abilities to do things that under normal circumstances or situations you're unable to do. To allow you to come up here and sing, me to stand up here and speak, others to come up and speak, to play the piano, to do whatever it may be, it may be is that you've been called to do. Holy Spirit, but you have to accept it. It's an individual thing, just the salvation of individuals. So is acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit in your life. So don't discard the Holy Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit is present. This is the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. If you wonder in your own personal life if the Holy Spirit is present, then I just simply ask you to do this. Call upon God. Ask Him to examine your heart, to reveal to you what needs to be revealed, and asking Him to fix any of those situations that is deterring you coming to full fellowship with Him. That's all you have to do. Holy Spirit, except in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, whatever it may be. Whatever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning's in your word. We pray your blessings upon the word, Lord, that your word does not return to you void. Praying and asking, Lord God, as the wind blew at Pentecost and filled the, the room and and the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. As you shook the room in which they were and giving them the boldness that they needed. Likewise, Lord God, we pray and ask that you do the same here and to those who hear this word. Do not let your word return to you, boy, Father. Praying and asking this in the name of Jesus. I heard, uh, just sit down a second, sit down, thank you. Andy Stanley, I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with who Andy Stanley is, his father's Charles Stanley. Andy Stanley is also a pastor, he has a very, very large church, uh, he's written several books. In, in one of his writings, in his books, actually he's talked about several different times, he talks about a niece that he has. And when she was little, growing up, she was tall and she was kind of lean and she had all the characteristics of an athlete of a, as a swimmer. So when she was little, her mommy and daddy entered her in, in swimming lessons and then they, she, she got on a swimming team and uh, then they, as, as all you parents who have kids who are involved in athletics every single weekend, they would take their little girl to the swim meets. And the little girl, she, this little niece she, uh, of Andy Stanley's, she loved going to the meets. She had all of her friends there. She, she, she enjoyed you know, fellowshipping and being with them. She loved everybody, and everybody loved her. And so she's in her first year of, the, uh, of being on this team and, and, and going to these meets, and she never won. The second year came around and she's on the swim team again and she goes to all these meets again and she's loved by everyone and she goes and, and she's, you know, just, just, she was just a bundle of joy to be with, about seven years old now. And she would swim in these meets and never won. Third year rolled around, the same thing. Fourth year rolled around about halfway through, halfway through the season. She's getting ready for another meet. And so she's at the pool, and her mother takes a Sharpie. You know what a Sharpie is. And so to help her out, she wrote on her arm what meet she would be in. And the last word she told to her now her nine-year-old daughter was, go and win. 
mother never told her that before. Go and win. And the little girl looked up at her mom. She says, this is a race? I thought this was a meet. Meaning, going out and meeting. You know? She went out and won the race. And won very consistently after that. We come and meet here on Sunday mornings. We meet in Bible study. We meet at different activities of the church. But we are in a race. We are in a race. And my question to you is how are you going to finish the race that you're in? How are you going to finish? You've been called to the race to go out and spread the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. To share it with your neighbors. To invite them on a Sunday morning to the house of God. That's what you've been called to do. Where we can come together now and meet. But you are in a race. It's the Holy Spirit that will enable you to run the race that you're in. Father, thank you for this morning's hour. Thank you, Lord God, again for the remembrance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As we leave here today, Father, help us to understand that we are in a race. We want to be able to say that we fought the good fight and that we have kept the faith and to know that there's a reward stored up for us in the heaven and to be able to enter the gates of heaven and to hear the voice of the one we serve saying to us well done good and faithful servant enable us help us Lord God to be a good and faithful servant to you Protect us in our journeys this day. Watch over us. Keep us all in your care. Bless each and every family. Let us all feel your presence in our lives daily. I ask you this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.